Hey, thanks for joining us for Artisan Online. It's our Easter online service, and we've got a great Easter message for you in just a moment, but I wanna let you know about one super important thing. We've got tons of awesome, super fun stuff coming up on our calendar, and so we wanna let you know to check that out um, on artisan.church. We've got our, our calendar of events coming up. Um, we've got all sorts of stuff coming up this spring, summer. It's gonna be great. We'd love for you to stay tuned to that, but otherwise, here is our Easter message from Pastor Sam Grasso. But today uh, we get to open up the word and really talk about the greatest story that's ever happened in the existence of mankind. It's the greatest story that we know of. And uh, it really began um, on Friday night as a church. We dove into the, the, the scriptures that tell the story of Jesus' crucifixion on a Roman cross. That he was actually tried and found guilty, even though he was an innocent man, and that he was put to, get, to death. Uh, on a Roman cross via crucifixion, and uh, we heard through that story that he died and that literally an earthquake happened, the veil was torn, this incredible moment happened, and because of that death, we actually remembered it through communion, but through the drinking of the cup and the eating of the bread, and memorialized the reality of what the, both of those items mean. But how many of you know the story did not stop there? We, we didn't end at the cross, we didn't end it at death, and the reality of what we celebrate with our Christian tradition here on Easter Sunday is that he is, in fact, now risen. But what's interesting about this fact is he alluded to it, he told people that he would be risen, and yet their focus was still on the tomb. Their focus was still on his burial. Their focus was still on the preparation of the body. In fact, they had put guards in front of this tomb. Uh, Jesus had died, and a, a wealthy man donated uh, what would have been considered a wealthy man's grave, its own tomb with a giant sto stone to protect it. And this was a picture of what really humans for centuries have been doing, and that is caring deeply about what happens and how they are remembered after they die. Caring deeply about how we are memorialized, how we are seen afterwards. And in fact, uh, we know that there are some of the, mo the, the, the wonders of the world are actually graves. That's something so great that would actually be considered a wonders of the world like the, the, e the pyramids in Egypt, right? We know that those were tombs. Uh, there was actually bodies that were laid in there. The Taj Mahal is, in fact, a, a, a form of a mausoleum. We, we see that people have constantly made these extravagant, exuberant, sometimes even exotic, crazy tombs. Some people even created mysteries around their death. And had they, people have spent decades searching for the tombs. They would store up treasure and put troves and troves. All, everything that they had built in their life, they wanted their tomb to exemplify that life. Now, in, in American culture, we're big on, how many of you know, memorials, right? And if you go to Washington, D.C., what are you looking at? You're looking at memorials that marked lives that were lived, people who built our nation, who led our nation during its early uh, infancy phases. There's these memorials, these mausoleums, these tombs become a focus. But the, it's interesting that a central theme of Easter is Jesus' tomb. And we can get caught up in that reality. But how many of you know a beautiful tomb is actually a false dichotomy? The fact that it's beautiful on the outside, perfect on the inside, outside, cannot take away from the fact that on the inside there is a decaying, nasty, rotten body. At the center of the tomb, no matter how glorious it is, there is something gross on the inside. There's something I don't want to touch. Have you ever encountered something in life? That's just so much, so far more beautiful on the outside than it is on the inside. Where you're so excited and you're anticipating something great and then you discover there's something a little bit different on the inside. My wife and I, when we were early on in our marriage and we were on a starting youth pastor's salary, we were determined to buy a house. To buy a house. Come on, it's a good finance. If you buy a house in your 20s, that'll set you, get you moving forward. And so we actually moved in with my parents for six months so we could save up on a down payment. Come on, there's no better way to really keep the romance going in a fresh marriage than moving into mom and dad's basement, right? Oh, yeah. And so we're living in the basement, and we're saving up. And, and uh, in the area around the church we were working at, the, there was one neighborhood 
within like a 30-minute drive of that church that we could afford, one. And that neighborhood was an old neighborhood in downtown Shakopee, Minnesota. And we, there was only three houses in this neighborhood that was even within um, our pre-approval letter range. And so we kind of honed in, as you do, on a favorite. And it had kind of a little bit of that historical charm. <clears throat> It was an early 1900s build, and some of the original woodwork was still there, and some of the original floors were still there, and it had just this feel to it. We're like, this is it. All the other ones were like boring ramblers that were just clean cut. We're like, this one's got character, right? And Chip and Joanna were just coming on the scene, and everyone's standards were going through the roof of what they could do with their first time home, and we're getting excited about what we're going to preserve and tell the story of the home. We actually get an offer accepted on this house. We get our inspection. And, and uh, we were smart because we included my dad in the inspection. He'd been in the trades for a long time. We're like, Dad, come inspect this with us. We're digging into the house, and it's just everywhere we looked. It's like, no, this is the house. This is the house. It's looking great. It's looking great. It looks so good. It looks so fresh. And we are truly, we're about to leave, and we're all excited. This is our home. We're going to have some kids here. This is going to be perfect. And my dad goes, hold on. We haven't checked the attic yet. We haven't checked the attic yet. We gotta, let's go peek up in the attic. So we bring the ladder upstairs. He pops open the attic, and he climbs up into the attic, and he's gone for a second, and all of a sudden, he just rushes back down. <laughs> and my dad, you know, was a sergeant in the military, tough guy, and he had this <gasps> shocked look on his face. And I was like, what is it? He goes, just go see. I go, I don't want to go see. <laughs> I don't want to. He goes, go see. And I crawl, crawl up into this attic, and up, I shine my cell phone light, and all I see is the entire ceiling is moving, the whole thing. There are dozens, hundreds of bats just completely coating the interior. The insulation was no longer insulation. It was like double the insulation because of all the bat poop that had built up inside this attic. It's like the, the sheetrock is just bending under the weight of the bat feces, right, that are up there. And the ceiling, and they're flying around, and they're just milling about, and I'm di I die back underneath. And I'm looking out there, I'm going, there's no way there's that many bats inside this house. You get this, like, creepy feeling, you know. And so I go, well, this won't be too bad. We can figure this out. I'm sure there's a, there's a solution here. And so I research and I identify the bats and they're brown-nosed bats or something along those lines. And it actually says that they're endangered, so you can't kill them. And I was like, I don't, maybe if I contact the state, I can let them know that they're not endangered. They just all live in this house. <laughs> they're all right here, all of them ever. And uh, we find out that the cost to remove them would be in the tens of thousands of dollars. And so we pass on the house. We pass. And we took the very clean cut, simple Rambler. <laughs> and it felt clean and nice and perfect. And we were happy with it. But there are times where things just, they look incredible. But when on a little bit further uh, uh, inspection, you start to discover there's something off here. There's something wrong here. It's not quite as it seems. It's not as it looks. And that's ultimately what a tomb is. It's this beautiful, marked memorial, and often people try to make these things as eternal as possible. Because how many of you know the older you get, we understand the fragility of life more and more. Hey, this is fleeting. This is passing. This is temporary. No matter what I do, time keeps passing. Anybody ever tried to stop time? Just ignore it. Pretend it's not real. It's passing. It's passing right now. It's always moving. And so the human nature is to figure out, can we build things? Can we construct things? Can we create an external that might seem eternal, that might last a little bit longer? And so naturally, when Jesus, in this most significant death in human history, dies on a cross, they want to put him in a tomb that memorializes he had shaken the whole known world. His message had reached out all across the world, and people have been flocking and they knew about him, and they were talking about him, and the miracles that had happened. And so they put him in this wealthy man's tomb and trying to put him into the constructs that the world have created. This is what you do with a body. This is what you do to honor the life that was lived. And so two women, uh, it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 through 8, that after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, come on, how many wish you were Mary Magdalene, not the other Mary, uh, went to look at the tomb, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. 
The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. I think this is an interesting description. Like, I just picture them, like, playing dead more. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, they're just hiding. Like, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not going to guard the tomb. This guy's crazy. No, they are. They're playing dead. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. I love that the angel's reminding, like, hey, by the way, he told you he was going to do this. (laughs) It's so interesting that the disciples scattered, isn't it? That they were so afraid for their life that disciples like Peter actually denied Jesus because they were scared that they were going to be crucified. It's pretty hard when you're living in the moment of chaos to believe that the miracle's still coming. We we do this. Our faith can really get shook in the middle because it feels chaotic. It feels crazy. And the disciples are living in this. And that miracle of Jesus coming back from the dead, that started to seem pretty crazy. But here the angels are reminding, don't you remember what he said? He's going to come back. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. The tomb's now empty. He's not there anymore. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. What a picture of real faith. Afraid, yet filled with joy. Come on, the fear of the Lord, but joyous in the process. I love that. And they ran to tell his disciples. And we actually know that they encountered Jesus first on the road to telling the disciples. And then Jesus went on ahead of them to Galilee and the disciples met him there. He's not here, church. He's risen. In one moment, this declaration from this angel changed and shifted eternity forever. And Jesus symbolically broke the classical constructs of human design, that we live our life, that we die, and that we get buried, and that in our burial we try to pay some sort of homage to the life that we lived and hope that we get remembered forever. And Jesus flipped this on its head, and the very beautiful tomb that he was supposed to occupy was now empty. It was empty, it was hollow, and he's not there. Church, have you ever looked for Jesus and failed to find him? Have you ever found yourself trying to find Jesus and wondering, am I looking in the wrong places? Am I going about this process wrong because I don't seem to be finding him? The Marys were looking for him where he no longer was. And here that we see that they were sure of his location, and yet they didn't find him where they anticipate. But the Bible Friend, promises that those who seek Jesus diligently will find him. It's a guarantee. If you go after him and you pursue him and you actually look for him where he is, you will find him. He even said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Seek Jesus and you're going to find him. You're going to find him. You can discover him. He's present, he's real, he's alive, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, he's interceding on your behalf, and he did all of this, the Easter story, the death, the resurrection, all of it, he did it for relationship with you. And you, as an individual, you matter deeply to him. But, so the better question really is not, can I find Jesus, but it's where do I look for Jesus? How does he fit into my life? How, how, what does it even look like? Well, I have heard it said in church, invite him into my life. What does that even look like? What does it look like to invite Jesus into my world? How do I pursue him? How do I find him? He's not going to fill, essentially, though, the problem is, is he's not going to fill the sort of earthly constructs that we create, these sort of tombs that we make in our lives, these sort of external focuses that we say, hey, Jesus, I've got my life. And I want to find you, but what that's going to look like, my seeking, my knocking, my looking, my, my trying to find you is going to be me sitting here waiting for you and asking you to just come and meet me, meet me and fill the life that I've already built. I've built this life. I've figured it out. I've got it all working. And Jesus, why don't you just come and join in with what I'm already doing? But that's not the invitation that he has for us today. You see, it's typical human behavior to enshrine our lives externally. It's typical behavior to focus so much on how we are perceived. 
how we are seen, how we are viewed, how people respond to us externally. In fact, the typical person in America right now is far more concerned with the external than the internal. The messaging is that as long as I look okay, then I'm probably going to be okay in the end. As long as everything appears okay, then I can sort of keep it together. Internally, I could be a mess as long as externally nobody sees it, nobody understands it, nobody can, can picture it. I'm just going to figure this out. And there's going to be a difference between my external and my internal. And for today, I'm going to coin a new phrase for us, okay? We're, we're going to start a phrase that's going to make sense. And everyone who's been to Artisan Church uh, Easter 2023, they're going to be like, oh, I remember that. It's a phrase. And what I want it to be, what we're going to call it today, is tomb mentality. Tomb mentality. Where we are empty and decaying on the inside, but on the outside we look healthy and beautiful. That we're building a life externally. Let me give a, uh, it, let me, this is my best attempt to sort of like Webster's Dictionary, my little term I just made up. Two mentality, crafting an external persona or picture that does not actually align with the internal person and personality. Creating a life for everybody to see, for everybody to experience, sometimes even morphing, twisting, and adjusting my personality the way that I think other people want to receive me the way that I think I'll get applauded, rewarded, promoted. I'm going to live externally. I'm going to constantly be tweaking and adjusting. You see, sometimes actually external is way easier because this is where we live in the tangible. It's what we see. I can control what we see, and that's what a tomb is. Control all the parts that people see, but how many of you know you're not allowed inside a tomb? That's the whole point. It's shut off. It's closed, it's shut, it's sealed. The body's in there, you don't go in. You don't go in. And so this was a massive moment when the angel actually rolled back the stone and exposed the inside of the tomb. To actually showcase the reality, it's empty. We don't live with this tomb mentality. We don't craft an external persona or picture of our life that does not align with our internal person and our divine personality the way that God made us to be. You see, Jesus understood that this was pretty common within human nature. Because before he died, he actually rebuked a group of Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 through 28. If you don't know, Pharisees were teachers of the law. They were actually religious leaders within the Jewish practices. And Jesus said this. He said, woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. Now, it's important to understand what they would have heard when they said that. You see, the Jews actually believed if you came in any sort of contact with a body that you became so unclean, you had to go through at minimum a week of cleansing in order to be made right again. In fact, it got so bad that the Pharisees started to teach that even if your shadow crossed over a grave site or where a body was that you had to go in and you were now unclean and you had to be made clean again. So they were dramatic in their picture of the, the, the filth that was on a dead body, the impurity that was on a dead body. So what they would do during the Passover is they would whitewash all of the tombs so that you knew exactly where the bodies were, where the tombs were, so there was no chance of you being unclean during Passover and missing out. So they'd whitewash it. They'd make the tombs look beautiful. They'd make them stand out on the inside, but covering the dysfunction on the inside. And Jesus describes this. He says, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything that's unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And this is Jesus talking very candidly, very raw, very real. But I'll just be honest, and then maybe you could be honest with yourself. There's been many times in my life where I've started to address, wait, I'm saying one thing and I'm living another. Have you ever caught yourself in an act of hypocrisy? I might be the only one, but I've caught myself in these moments going, hey, I've been saying that to my kids and then I've been doing this. Hold on, I, my, as a dad, i got to line that up. Hey, I've been... Pastoring people in this, but then I, I slipped into anger there. Okay, I got I to gotta check that. I got to make sure 
that something's happening from the inside out, not the outside in. I, I don't want to be a whitewashed tomb. I don't want to live with a tomb mentality where my words are correct, but my actions are wrong. I don't want to live with tomb mentality where I, I give off the, the persona and the idea of a healthy, whole individual, but really I'm just, I'm dying and decaying on the inside. You see, these Pharisees, they had properly handcrafted an exterior that appropriately resembled their line of work, all while letting their interior world fall apart with pride and arrogance, control, abuse. They're living in hypocrisy. So Jesus is showing us this morning, church, through the empty tomb of the Easter story, that he works in the exact opposite strategy of tomb mentality. And he was making it clear in this passage. He is not where you think he is. He is risen. You can't find him by living as the world does. You can never get your outside, the exterior of your life, to look good enough, to be pleasing enough, to earn your way to Jesus. There is nothing you can do. We are not saved by works. We are not saved by the efforts of our hands. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone and saying it's in your message, it's in your story that I can experience salvation. Church, he wants to work. This is something we say all the time at Artisan. He wants to work from the inside out, not the outside in. You can't get yourself right and then come to him. It's impossible. You'll always come up short because he's a savior that wants to work with you on your eternal positioning, not just your temporary prospering. He's not just trying to make you good for a day to be blessed for a moment. He wants you eternally positioned to spend all of eternity with him. He wants you to think and build and live your life with an eternal perspective, not a temporal one. Not trying to store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust will destroy it, but to store up treasures in heaven where nothing can touch it by the way in which we live for him, working from the inside out. Don't invite Jesus into your tomb mentality. He's not going to take up resident in some sort of whitewashed tomb. How many of you know? They created a literal box to put Jesus in. Here's where you're going to fit, Jesus. Here's where your dead body goes. Here's the tomb. It's a nice one. We got a really good one for you. Go stay in this tomb. This is what we made for you fit in my box. And Jesus said, I'm not going to stay in anybody's box. I'm going to blow open the doors of that tomb. I'm going to show you that I do not fit into the constructs of man. I do not fit into what we create. You are not the determiner of how I'm going to respond and move in your life. You are just to receive it. You're supposed to receive the free gift. He doesn't want you to, uh, he won't take up residence in a whitewashed tomb. He wants to wash your very soul as white as snow. I said that phrase at our Good Friday service, and our seven-year-old daughter, Willa, she joined in. She, she was, has been saved and baptized, and we wanted her to be a part of a public communion service, and so she was here. And after the service, she goes, Daddy, you know, I heard you say that Jesus wants to wash you as white as snow, but look outside. The snow is not white right now. That's not a very good illustration. I'm like, Fair. That's a good point. <laughs> Leave it to a seven-year-old to poke holes in your sermon, right? Like, <laughs> it's awesome. But picture like a freshly fallen snow, right? A beautiful snow that covers all. It wants to cover you. Church, your faith won't work out unless he can work from the inside out. We put it very, very simply. Your faith won't work out unless he can work from the inside out. You have to give him full access to your interior. Here's the reality, though. Some of us, that's a scary thought. It's a lot easier to have the appearance of being good than to actually be good. It's a lot easier to have the appearance of health than to actually be healthy. It's a lot easier to make things look beautiful on the outside than it is on the inside. Some of you have even been keeping relationships at an arm's distance because you're afraid that if they would actually get to know you, they would reject you. So you're not, you're not even allowing community in your life because you're afraid that someone's going to discover the interior you and that it won't align with the exterior picture that you've created. You see, the mission of Artisan Church is on our sign. 
We actually want to bring people home to the heart of God. And this picture, this phrase is described beautifully in John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus said this, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, and then my Father will love them, and we will come to them, and we're going to make our home with them. We want to come and we want to fill you from the inside out. We want to come and we want to take up residence. Not in the little box, the little world, the little tomb you've created, this little existence that you've created. We actually want to shatter that completely. We're out of the tomb. Nothing, we, you can't create anything that we fit into. The only thing we can take up residence in is your very heart, your soul, the interior of who you are. When you live by tomb mentality, church, emptiness is your guarantee. The end result of building an external life that's shallow on the inside is exactly that. It's a tomb. Death and decay on the inside while looking beautiful on the outside. And the, the greatest feeling of emptiness will slowly consume your life. Have you ever met somebody? Maybe you're in this place. Their life is full of stuff, but they would describe it as somehow it's empty. It's empty. Why does it still feel empty? No matter how much I gain, I, I just can't seem to fill the gap in my life. I can't seem to fill it. There's still this emptiness. There's still this decay in my internal self. As I was pray praying and preparing for this message, I really felt strongly that many of us are dealing with what you might call an empty life. Maybe you've even described it that way. My life just feels empty right now. I go to work. I do the things. I'm raising my family, I'm, I'm involved, I serve, I just, I do stuff, I'm, I go places, but it just feels empty. It doesn't have the same life it once did. It doesn't have the same passion it once did. How many of you know something special done in repetition loses that special feeling pretty quickly? If I start to repeat it over and over and over and over again, all of a sudden it doesn't taste so special, doesn't feel so special, doesn't, it doesn't seem so special. It doesn't suffice. So then we go chasing after more and more and more and more and more. And we get caught in the rat race of life. Essentially, we designed and crafted a world with an intent to fill our lives. And yet we are left as empty as the beautiful Easter tomb. Emptiness has sort of become normal for some of us. This feeling of emptiness, this feeling of longing. But church, the promise of Jesus' empty tomb is that your life doesn't have to be. Your life does not have to be empty. The band can come on up as we close. Your life can actually be full. That tomb is a picture of what your life is pre-Jesus. But Jesus is saying, don't look for me there. I've actually gone ahead of you. Where did the Marys find him? On the road while they were on mission that was given by God. Hey, take this message. Go tell the disciples. You get to be the very first evangelist, Marys. You get to be the very first people to get to carry the good news, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I want you to bring it to the disciples. And while they got on mission for Jesus, he met them in the road. They're the first ones to see him in his glorified, perfect condition. And for many of us, we're going, God, why can't I find you in these tombs of life? <laughs> because he will not fill the constructs of this world. He won't do it. John chapter 10, verse 10, says this, the thief, Jesus is speaking. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I love this word. You ever been really full? This week I was blessed with a trip to a steakhouse. 32 ounce cowboy ribeye. <laughs> Tastes even better when you don't have to pay for it, amen? Oh, bite after bite after bite. <laughs> I kept thinking I wouldn't get full. 
I mean, you know, eventually get full. There's something about feeling full. There's something to just consuming with your, with, uh, until your heart is content. There's something with understanding. The Bible describes this fullness as a fullness of joy. Do you want to be full or do you want to be empty? Some of you literally emotionally, you're hangry. Your internal self is screaming, feed me. Feed me from the inside out. Stop trying to figure out how to look the part and actually become who God made you to be. Don't create a mausoleum for you to exist and die and decay in, hoping that they'll remember your name. To be really honest, and I, I'm at a place in my life, I actually believe this. I would love if the legacy of my life brings glory to Jesus' name over my name. We lay down the arrogance of needing a mausoleum, of needing a memorial, of needing all the recognition. Because at the end of the day, if I can be full internally in this life, then I've got something to feed my family, feed my wife, feed my kids with. I can spiritually invest in them, invest in the next generation, feed my church, have something. Why does Jesus say, I'm the bread of life? I want to give you living water. Because he's saying spiritually, I'm going to fill you up. Do not live by bread alone. Quit thinking externally. Quit thinking as the world does. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's got one move, and that move is to lie to you about what will fill you. Hey, you'll find purpose here. Hey, you'll find wisdom here. Hey, this is when you'll, once you get there, once you get that boat, once you get that cabin, once you get that marriage, once you get that kid, once you get that dog, come on, okay, you got the wrong dog, just, I, I get a different dog that's not so crazy, and then you'll feel great, and, and keep going, once the bank account, once, the, once our retirement, I mean, it's the lie, and all of that does one thing, or a few things, steals, kills, and destroys. Breaks down the constructs that you were created. We were not designed to live with tomb mentality. We were designed to accept Jesus and ask him to fill the only part of him that us that really matters, not the little world we've made. I want Jesus to shatter my thinking. I want him to shatter the world that I've tried to make because I believe he's bigger, I believe he's better, I believe he's greater and above all of it. So the thief is offering you a lie that always leads to emptiness. But when you find Jesus, like the Marys did, when you find him on the road, when you get on mission, when you stop trying to put him in places he's not, you find fullness. It's a fullness of joy. You'll be empty no more. And he carries with him a purpose and a plan and a life worth living. That's what he promises us. 